Welcome, and this um, talk is about um, Eventures, the set of libraries I've built to support .NET developers who want to build event source applications. Um, my name is Alexei. I work at uh, ABAX as chief architect here in Norway and uh, part-time as developer advocate for Event Store. I some time ago wrote a book, Hands-on Geometry Design, uh, with .NET Core, which is a bit dated now. And in fact, that's an event sourcing book in disguise. The publisher just didn't allow me to put this in the title. So, but that's how it goes. Um, why I decided to build um, yet another thing that supports event sourcing. Because what I observed over, well, I, I started to build event source systems for production use back in 2015 or something. And um, the time passes by and I see that uh, we made mistakes back then. And people who are trying to build um, event source systems today they kind of stumble upon the same mistakes, the same issues, and they try to overcome it. And um, you know, what happens when we try a new pattern and um, we kind of fail, it doesn't work as expected, we get production issues or we never get to production as such. Well, some people just complain to themselves, to their colleagues and abandon the whole thing. Some other people do the same, but they also write a blog article on Medium and share it on Twitter and get a lot of likes. Be from people that did the same, like from the first category, right? Um, and that's kind of disappointing because in my opinion, event sourcing is quite a good pattern. I think it's brilliant. It's just when applied incorrectly, it might do more harm than, um, than benefit. You see these things. These are those Medium articles that I mentioned. Stop overselling event sourcing is a silver bullet. Why don't, what they don't tell you about event sourcing, don't let internet dupe you, event sourcing is hard. Well, it can be. And why event sourcing is microservices communication out of pattern? Well, it is actually true. So, it's, for some reason, there is a bit missing, bit of text missing here. 100% that's correct if you do it wrong. Uh, of course, we can say what's right, what's wrong. Who says what's right and who says what's wrong? So, well, then we start to search for information in the internet and then we stumble upon these diagrams, right? This is a popular blog and I copy pasted, you can see the link here. It's not that I want to blame some people for posting these diagrams, it's just that I want to say this is real. They do secure rest with a broker. Well, not the best idea in the world. Um, this is the variation, the previous thing. This is something that I don't understand because it has so many different things that don't really look like event sourcing or whatsoever because it just has event store on the side is like a bucket and but the, in the middle of things there is an event bus. And um, this, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but um, the article says, white paper's latest modern application development on AWS with event sourcing. And these guys integrate using domain events, which is under pattern on its own. This is like why microservice is bad for microservice, why event sourcing is bad for microservice integration. And this is just everything. The, the kind of collection of underparts on one place, and you can hence from colors that somehow close to AWS world. And um, as part of my job in dev advocacy in event stories, talk to people that do this in production because they use event store to be our product. And uh, we see all kind of variations of things. Sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's kind of okay. Sometimes it's pretty good, but it's never like they've done it and everything worked as we expected. It almost never happens. And uh, I see two problems here. So remember, those of you who learn about event sourcing, um, the pattern was originally created by Greg as the distributed domain design. 
That's why a lot of people speaking about event sourcing have DDD in mind. Right? Because in my opinion, uh, one of the most powerful things in event sourcing is that the first pattern that exists that allows you to persist behavior rather than persist state. And that's extremely useful. However, you can do it in many different ways. Like, for example, you can create um, an event log of sorts and shovel events over there. That's what event store on the side is a bucket um, implements. And use it and say, I have all my events, so I persisted the behavior. But then it's not used for anything, right? Um, it's not used for decision making. It's not used as a source of truth. Because everything that's published also goes to some sort of event bus. Um, then um, I think Event Store as a company was complacent for some time because we kind of we have a database that implements event sourcing from ground up because it was built with event sourcing in mind. And then Confluent came and they brought a Kafka. Kafka was designed originally as a centralized logging ingester, right? And then it was promoted to be a broker. And somehow a few years back. And there were big companies starting to use Kafka and say we are doing event sourcing without knowing what event sourcing actually is. Because what they do, they publish events to Kafka, and then a few moments later, this, these events get projected or what they call materialized um, views, materialized store, materialized state. And that state is used for making decisions, but there is a lag in time between the event is published to Kafka and this materialized view is updated. And you have a risk of making decisions based on stale state, and that's, this problem is real. And like 50% of articles saying event sourcing is not good, meaning that as well. Um, I say this pattern has a name. I just don't remember what it is. It's like read your own things, but it's not event sourcing as such. So it's just a misuse of the term. Um, that's why, uh, like, when I started Adventures, I wrote a bunch of things in the documentation website, but it's not just a doc, like API reference, and you go through and say, this is the class that does this. Um, I have very strong opinions how it should be done, because I built several with my colleagues, who are probably here as well, from Airbox, and I've seen systems, and I see their suffering, and we've done it, and it works, right? So I have these... Um, kind of um, courtesy to say that there is a right way. And that's what I try to describe in the docs. Maybe I wanted it to be just a documentation website with some examples, but eventually I started Adventures and it just rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled. But the right way article is actually there in the docs. Uh, but I don't want to keep it just as a library docs. I want to explain things how I believe it should be done. But it's not just an explanation. That's what you find in blogs. Explain how things should be done and give a couple of examples, and then you can make a Hello World application. That's not what I want. I'm fed up with Hello World examples because I want to do a bit more, but there is nothing. It's like a wasteland. Everything stops right there. I've written one event. i projected one event. It's not only about event sourcing. It's like about everything, but in particular here. Um, so, Eventures is opinionated, and you can see opinionated person is certain about their beliefs, express their ideas strongly and often. That's what I do here. Um, it, which means that it's built in a certain way, and it's built in a certain way not because uh, I want to expose some, or impose some sort of dictatorship of how you build your systems with, with these libraries if you decide to do so, but because certain things in my opinion, need to be done in a certain way so you don't shoot yourself in the foot. Because I've done with my colleagues these mistakes in the past, and I've seen other people making the same mistakes all over again, and I don't want you to make those mistakes too. And it can save you a hell of a lot of time. So there comes another problem when like, trying to do things yourself, because Greg was and is famous for saying, it's so easy, you can do everything yourself, it just takes a day or two, or a couple of weeks, or maybe half a year, or maybe you're never done. In two days, you can build a quick prototype. Um, you can build a very premature set of uh, base uh, primitives that you can use across, in one application, for example. That's what I did in the book. If you go to 
book example repository, if in, even if you never read the book, you can see that there, are, there is a small library that has like 15, 20 classes that implement the basic things. But that's not production ready. You need to do something more to make it production ready. And then you need to main it, maintain it. And that's the problem. So when you stumble upon an issue, you start to like, okay, let me fix it. This is the way I want to do it. And then there is another issue, there is another issue. And of course, you start maintaining this thing along with maintaining your own system. So you spend time, instead of building your business applications, you start to build, well, you start to maintain your own thing. And that's not, let's see if I, yeah. We're going to make a framework. That's what the companies do. Every single company that I talk to and I work for and who implement an event source system have their own set of libraries because there is just nothing there. And some people use uh, Eventflow, which is decent. Chris Grondon from Event Store created Reactive Domain, which is also pretty decent. Uh, but some of them are dated. Some of them, like we are .NET 6, like .NET 5 is legacy and nobody wants to write code in C Sharp 9 and stuff like that. So, like, how to move this forward? And sometimes people who don't do this for a living, they drop their own creations, like open source frameworks. And sometimes people build these frameworks inside the company, they leave it, and the, the framework stops getting, being maintained. So, it's actually real. I'm sorry, Glenn, you're here, but I have to show this. Um, but you also, we, we are proud that we've done it in ABAX. This is the uh, ABAX framework that contains, started as an event sourcing framework, and we see how cool we are as a company. We have GitLab, you know, and Event Store and Kafka and everything. You see, this is how it goes. These are just projects. So there are thousands of lines of code that support different aspects of production ready event sourced application. And it's still by far not complete. So it's easy in theory, but if you want to build the production system with it, you need to do something else. You, well, not something else. You need to do something in addition, right? So that's boilerplate. Essentially, instead of start, like you go and say, I want to build a system with event sourcing. Where do I start? There's like nothing there. So let me build something. And then you start to write something. And then initially, it's probably within your app. And then someone else says, oh, it seems to work fine. Or maybe you need to spin up another service with, with the same thing in the same bundle context. Say, so let me share it. You put it in the NuGet package or stuff like that. But you have a lot of boilerplate code. So event sourcing is easy when you have all the things. So you need to have some sort of set of domain model primitives, like supporting entities, aggregates if you go with the DDD route. Um, you need to have the collect collective changes from, from your domain objects. Um, you need to support optimistic concurrency. Um, you need to handle different sort of exceptions. You need to have type agnostic serialization because you cannot just use, like when you store events, you need to store the types, so you need to know how to deserialize them, right? Um, you don't want to couple yourself to your CLR type name because it stops you from refactoring your apps because messages are persisted forever and stuff like that. And you need to be able to read them forever. Um, you need to have a proper event store support so you can actually persist your events and read them back very fast. For supporting read model queries, you need to have real-time subscription to, those, to the event store that can catch up and read from the beginning of time, projecting to some sort of read model and bring your materialized view alive. But also you need to continue real-time and fetch these events very quickly and project them as well. So you have a uh, very small delay of stale, or not that stale kind of read models because they're still used in the user interface, but not for making decisions. You need to have some sort of application layer thing that would talk, that would sit between the API layer because it's just a transport. You want to implement ports and adapters. You want to isolate yourself from the transport, so application talk to the domain, right? And transport talk to the application. And you need to handle all sorts of scenarios for command handling in the application layer, like failures, retries, whatever else. You need decent infrastructure support for all these things. These are just sort of foundation, like a set of obstructions, but you need to connect it to the infrastructure. Let's say I want to project to MongoDB, how I do that? Um, I want to use Event Store DB as my Event Store, how I do that? And um, you need to support, of course, before you go to production, 
I hope you agree. If you don't, reconsider, please. You need to have high level of observability and monitoring your applications in order to run it in production, because otherwise it's just irresponsible. Easy, right? Yeah, that actually seems quite a lot. <laughs> so I like defined for myself, because when I started to write it, I have several ways, because I've done it so many times, and every time it's a little bit different. I said, okay, this is public one. This is not something used by one company or another company or two companies. It can be used by many different companies and people with different level of experience. So first thing I would like to do is that when a developer starts to use Ventures, there is very little boilerplate that you need to introduce in order to make things work. And by doing so, I lowered the entrance barrier to the beautiful world of event sourcing. Instead of creating it like you do everything yourself and stuff like that, you actually don't have to do it. Another thing that well, I was in, in my book, I was trying to implement some functional patterns like um, certain things became like business logic and uh, change in the state, like this fold function became pure functions. But I, I, I understood at some time that I am fighting the language. C sharp is still object oriented language. Okay, let's do it like this because most of the people we talk, we love F sharp, some of us, and we love functional programming, but still do and earn money on writing object oriented systems and object oriented code. It might change in time, but so far with C sharp 10 is still the case. And I want the thing play nicely with .NET. It means that .NET 6 introduces minimal API configuration, sort of web API. And um, like uh, last week, I built support for that, reducing boilerplate even more. I'll show you how it's done. So with these things in mind, I want to show you how it actually works. So I don't have slides left. I have one more. But we are not done yet. So now I'm an old man, I need glasses. Let's see. This is the website, right? It's ventures.dev. The thing is that docs here are heavily obsolete because it talks about legacy version, which is from August, see? Um, this is how it looks like. This is kind of um, what I consider a minimum set of things that you need. But of course, it has certain level of infrastructure support. In particular, it has Google Cloud support, MongoDB, RabbitMQ, which you might not need, right? Um, the core stuff is here, but it's still quite a lot. If you look here, the quite a lot of stuff, and like if you don't use it, I'll bet you money, if you start doing it yourself, you will end up with this or more. So we have serialization, metadata handling, exception handling, diagnostics, the application layer, how to handle the store, some other tools, and domain level primitives. Um, I introduced messaging in the, uh, in the library because, or there's a separate library for, uh, that's called producers, because event sourcing is kind of messaging by, by default, right? You produce events, you store them, but it, there are, these are messages that are important, they have an ID, they have all the attributes of messages. That's why it's so easy to use Kafka with them, because you can just shovel them over. Um, so sometimes, e even in a, like, Event source systems often communicate with asynchronous messaging. That's kind of, that's very easy to build. That's why I built these producers. When I started to build producers, naturally, like I say, I couldn't really use event store DB as a, as a transport, so I need something else. So I built support for Google PubSub because that's what we use in ABUX. But it's pretty easy to build one for, uh, I'm confronting myself, of course, I'm saying that's easy. But there is an abstraction, there is an example how to build the thing, for example, for, to support Event Hub in Azure. Maybe I can build it myself, or maybe I will. Uh, subscriptions, real-time subscriptions that support all sort of things, like reaction to domain events, like con conversion pub private events to public events, and shoveling them over to the broker uh, for integration. And then um, projections with subscriptions, the real-time ones, to, to, for, for materialized views, or read models, as we call them. All these things became actually pretty hardcore because that thing is not easy at all, as I found out. I knew that before, but um, 
when I started doing this, it became a bit more obvious that you need a bit more than you usually do. So, um, and it goes down to things like registering your thing with the I container, two lines of code instead of 25, stuff like that. So, but let's see how that actually works. I have this sample app that I used in my workshop. I had two days workshop uh, about DDD and the event sourcing, and yesterday we were only going through event sourcing. So this is the app. Let me run it. Oh, let's look at the domain model, how it's implemented. So you can see that this library has no other dependencies that the core part of the eventures, which has no dependence except of this serializer on its own, and another time because I use it for days. And that's how the domain object looks like. So basically, uh, I separate the state from the aggregate itself. So there is a piece of logic and piece of state. And they are kind of, they're not independent, but they are in different places. So in this case, I want to book a room. I want to ensure that this booking doesn't exist yet. I want to call external service to check if the room is available, because I don't know it. I can see how much money is still outstanding because there is the price of the booking and there is uh, the prepaid amount. And I meet a new event, which is the room booked. And then I mark this uh, paid if necessary. And this is another function that checks if the outstanding amount is zero. And if so, it emits the event called booking fully paid. So that is not hard. You can see it in all the examples. But all this stuff behind it is already working, right? So how this works? Let's run it. So I have this Vico API. I put one, two, three, and let's say. Yesterday I was putting 31st of November here, and I was getting null. And we spent like 15 minutes to find out what's wrong. And someone said, you know, I changed login level from information, from warning to information and started to work. Another person came and said, I moved that line one, uh, uh, this line, one line up, and it started to work. And we had all kind of combinations. I did all of the things because it was like magic. Nothing works for some reason. I don't know what's happening. We found out that 31st of November is not something that exists. Um, so 100 euros. So this is the command, right? I sent the command through from, from my browser to the API. API calls the app service, and the app service called my domain layer. And the domain layer says, I'm fine. It emits an event, and the event gets persisted to the store. So let's check the store. There we go. This is the stream of events that's created, and there is one event called book, room booked, and you can see all the stuff in here. Everything is fine, and it calculated the outstanding amount. So let's do something else. Let's supply the discount. And that's enough. Let's go here. Let's go to the stream and see discount applied. And we apply discount. There is some domain logic that calculates how much money is still outstanding. Right? There is logic there to call um, the discount service to find out how much you need to discount. And it says if the discount costs 2021, it will give you half price. Otherwise, it will give you 10 euros unconditionally, which is nice. That's something you wouldn't do in production systems. So it all works fine. Right? Just like how how does it get how does it get wired up? Let's stop this for a moment. Well, it's not that hard actually. So if you look here, these things are almost empty. Well almost, right? So we have an application service which does all the things behind the scenes for you. You just need to register. It's not a registration as such. It's a cell application service when you, const when you construct it. Th these are my command handlers. For example, the command handler book room looks like this. It just calls booking book room. And the booking would be, in this case, an empty entity because it's new. If we say apply discount, it operates an existing entity. So I need to know how to fetch it. So I give, it, I give the handler the function that will retrieve an ID from the command. 
and then I will execute the operation. So it's actually pretty easy to understand, in my opinion at least. I might be biased though. So how this lands in the API? Well, then the API becomes really dumb because it has nothing to do. It just needs to, it's a transport, right? So we isolated ourselves, we created a port for the application, which is the application server, and we attach the, use the HTTP adapter to call the application service using HTTP API. So we see that it's pretty easy. You just say, this is my method, this is my route. I get the payload from the body and I call the handle method. There is one trick here because this is not the controller base. It could be, but it's something that basically takes the result of application ha service handling the command and converts it to this one action result, because of course you don't want your application server to return the action result. But what this thing is, action result, that's actually pretty interesting, because that's also kind of, not everyone does this, and I think it's extremely useful. So remember I executed this thing, the first command book the room, and that's what I got back. So first of all I got the whole new state of my domain object back to the UI so I can show it straight away. I don't really need to query it again because that's what people do. This is the state, right? It gives you the success uh, indication and it gives you the list of changes. So let's say you have a Vue.js with Vuex or you have React application with Redux on your front end. So instead of querying the new states that would lead you to the stale materialized view because you do it within a milliseconds or microseconds, you can return them the list of events that they know how to apply in their Redux mutator, uh, what is called, reducers, and they update the front end state instead because the command has been executed. They know that it worked. So it eliminates so many issues that people usually stumble upon and say, this is eventually consistent, so what I do is whole crisis, right? You don't have to do queries when you just done the operation. The, uh, the API can return you the result that tells you what happened, right? For example, if I execute this action again, like let me run this. Okay, fine. If I execute it again, what happens is that I get a result back. Let's say it's 4-9 conflict, and uh, there is a message saying that update booking with this blah, 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 because it already exists. You cannot create the same booking twice. And there is no new state coming, and there are no changes, which means that you can also properly render it on the UI without querying anything. Um, in my opinion, that's pretty cool, because I've n I rarely seen things like that applied. People usually prefer to requery. Um, and the reason for this class to exist the base class, is basically to translate the internal result from the application service to this, to HTTP code, 409, 200, 404, and so on. Um, so it's kind of a mediator between the transport and the application. And how does it get like all wired up? Well, this .NET 6 minimal thing, API, whatever. Um, I just configure JSON, I do Swagger things like everywhere. Um, ignore open telemetry for now, we'll get back to it. And then I say add adventures. So that's not something in adventures, that's my call here. I configure the serializer to work with Node time nicely. I say I want to have my event store DB client, I want to aggregate store, I want application service. I add some services, and this is it. That, and that it start, from there it starts to work, there is nothing more to do. On the, on the command side, right? Everything gets executed properly and so on. So now I need projections. I need to materialize my changes in a query model so I can query it effectively and show efficiently and show it in the UI in a different way, right? I have these things. Let me comment it out and run it. And it's all good. These things that I just that done on the, um, on, like by executing those commands, they need to reflect in the application or in the database. So I have two collections here, bookings and my bookings. 
and my book is this, the power of event sourcing by turning your database like 90, 90 degrees back and forth because uh, my bookings have a booking ID as a primary key of sorts. And you can see here is this booking ID 1 to 3, right, and all the details. But this one allows me to turn it upside down and say the guest would be my booking ID or the, the ID of the document now. And if I need to have like booking com thing saying show you, me all my bookings, you will see it in one single document. You don't need to run queries for it. So I have two projections here. Let me just make one more booking for myself. One, two, four. At the same time and the same date in the same room. Let's see what happened. Uh, no. Here we go, both of them. So, I mean, I, I, want, I don't want to go to details uh, about event sourcing, but this is a very nice thing of event sourcing that you can actually project by the use case, right? You can create different representations of your data in any database you want, just to show it nicely. Like, here is Mongo serves the purpose. You can project to SQL, you can project to Elastic. So, how is, this, how is it done? Well... Here we go, queries. Let's look at my booking projection. That's it. I mean, of course, if you make more things, you need to write more code. But basically, what you write is how you, the document in Mongo gets updated or SQL Server gets updated, but you don't really write everything else, like how subscription gets wired up, how it connects to your event store, how it means the checkpoint, the offset and the stream, and stuff like that, serialization, deserialization, all these things are being handled. We also have, like, we know these are events, how we keep them serialized and deserialized. Well, serialization is easy. You can serialize almost everything. Um, but if I looked at the event store, you can see here this is the event type. It's kind of like, how do I know that I need to deserialize to that particular CLR type, to this one? Discount applied. Well, it's not handled in projection, nevertheless. Well, we have this kind of, we played around with different things, and people are saying, OK, I need to register my string, like the type name, in the, some sort of map for ventures to know how to deserialize it. And I keep forgetting to do this. You add more events, and off you go, it doesn't work. And you find it in runtime. So what we have done is, you can annotate your events using this attribute, and we will scan assemblies that are your application assemblies, find all of them in the register and type map. So you don't need to do anything at all. Which is, you can say magic, but it's not. It's actually like 10 lines of code. You can look it up. It all works. So um, let's see where we are. Another thing is about this need for um, like if you have two different bound contexts, maybe sometimes within bound context you have two different services or applications, and they need to talk to each other. There is the thing I showed on the slides that there is an, the publishing domain events to the broker for the other service to consume is clear anti-pattern because they don't share the same language. And by doing so, so, you couple your domain model, and domain events are part of your domain model, to the public contract, because you publish it to the outside, it automatically becomes a public contract. You can't refactor your domain model anymore because every change in your event schema will lead to like break consumers, right? So you don't want to do that. Therefore, you, need, you usually introduce at some point, not like Greenfield day two or day three, like, but maybe months two when you're ready to go to production, then you say, I want to have a stable messaging API for my events go to integration events and publish them somewhere else. So um, then you need some kind of transformation. You might even enrich your events that are going out. You might split them in two or stuff like that. And you may support different API versions for public contracts. So that's, that's basically where producers came from, because integration concern is a bit different from event sourcing as such. So if we look here in payments, we have this thing that's called what I use. I created this thing called shovel. So you literally take a shovel, and you receive events from event store, and you shovel it to some kind of broker. And you can do transformation in between. 
So shovel works extreme, it's on the surface, it's extremely simple. Inside, it's pretty complex. But what you need to do as a developer using this library is basically say, I'm going to subscribe using this subscription and use that producer. It could be PubSub producer, RabbitMQ producer, whatever you support. And I need to run this transformation in between. And transformation function looks like this. So basically, it says, oh, this, is, this is like custom code, totally custom. You need to find out what message you got from the store, and you create a new message. In this case, I have an integration event, and you need to tell the shovel where to put it, in which stream or topic or whatever. So here I convert from one contract to another. Let's see how that works. So my booking is running. I just do the payment thing. OK, now I have this. Let's say payment one, and then booking ID one, two, three. And it was 90 euros outstanding, as far as I remember. I have some five euros. Mum, let's see what happens. So, first we see that in the payment context, there was an event produced in the payment stream, so payments recorded in a different service. I just run it in a single store because for convenience, so I don't need to switch between infrastructure. But ideally, they should be used in different stores. They don't know about each other that much, except to the public contract, which is produced. So this is the main event, right? Payments recorded, fine. So it comes from Stripe or whatever. And then my shovel, using that function, which I just showed you, this small one, it produced a new one in the integration stream or topic in PubSub or RabbitMQ Exchange, conveying this information to the outside. And when this is handled in the booking context, what happens is that it receives it. Where was it here? And then it says, I recorded the payment inside my booking. And because the amount dropped to zero, I mark this booking as fully paid. So this is pure integration. And you can see it's in the booking itself, uh, here, it is, done by, it is done by using the integration subscription. So this is how it works. And what is the event handler? Well, it's this one. So I need to take the dependency on the app service. That's why you want this service to exist. You don't want to call aggregate store from the API controller and stuff like that. You have messaging API, you have HTTP API, you have gRPC API. I want to isolate yourself from a transport. Here we use a different transport, but the same command service. And then what we do? Well, we just call the command service to handle the command. We convert the event we received, the integration event, we convert to command and call the app service. So the same loop going on and on, like if you ever um, seen this thing from Alberto Brandolini. I think we have it in the chat. <laughs> the picture that explains almost everything, right? Uh, so it's a bit too small. But basically, uh, the user somehow sends the commands to, to your system. The system engages the aggregate or whatever. It produces an event. The event can go to the to another system, this Lilux sticky node, which we observed in payments, and then it issues a command. So we had this record payment, payment recorded, it goes to the integration shovel, it produces a command, record payment in booking, and uh, another site, it, this, the same event gets stored, and it projects to the read model, uh, my bookings and the booking state. So, and it goes on and on. The old systems work like this, not in all systems events are expressed explicitly. So I hope that seems kind of okay-ish. What I, what, I, what I mean is that this thing is, is not hard. It, like the code that you write is mostly business code. There is no boilerplate as such. Um, there is one interesting thing that I built in terms of this new uh, minimal API stuff. If you look here in integration, no, 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 wait a sec. This is the payment command service. You've seen this Vagor API right here. It produced a normal endpoint with the contract with saying, I returned 200, I returned uh, 400, 404, and 409. So 
all I needed to do to make this whole thing work is to... So this, these are booking commands. Just let me sh show you the difference. They're just playing records, right? And then I need the controller. This is the payment command, and I tell you there is no controller in this payment application. Because I say these static class payment commands inside are all commands about my payment aggregates, and this is the HTTP command. I will create an endpoint for you with verb post, and the route will match the record payment record name. Of course, you would argue that you, can, you will break the refactor, and I contradict myself, so I change the name of this record, and the API goes to hell. Well, there is a parameter for HTTP commands attribute that we can specify the route explicitly. So, so basically, another piece of boilerplate, uh, the controller that needs to talk to app service gets removed and taken care by sort of, it's not a convention really, but you annotate your thing and say, I want to expose it through HTTP API. Somewhat you can see it closer to like product above definitions where you can annotate it I want for this product contract, HTTP API as well, and it will create it for you. Stuff like that, but there is no code generation here. It just uses a normal .NET code. You can find it in the Eventus repository. It's just like 20 lines of code. But the last bit, remember I talked that you cannot really put the system in production unless you properly observe it. Eventus is observed on like all the levels. So let me just run this again so I can show you some metrics. Oh, it's already, no, it's not running. It executes. So, this is Zipkin. You know what Zipkin is? You know what open tracing is, open telemetry? Zipkin is this lightweight of Jaeger. So if you ever worked with collected traces with Jaeger, you, um, Zipkin runs without any persistence right now in memory and just collects traces and allows me to visualize. And it's very lightweight. So what do I have? Well, look at this. This is this, the payment thing that I've done. So how does it look like from the global perspective? Like we, remember, we're running two distinct services that are not connected to each other other than through the broker. The fact they are in the same solution doesn't mean that they, they are two diff different applications, right? They don't know about each other. So what we've got, the payment received record payment HTTP. This is traced by, um, instrumented by the OpenSlemetry instrumentation, which is out of the box available. I will show you how it's done. But I'm doing OpenSlemetry talk later today, last slot of the day. So if you're interested more to know more, you can come over. And then it calls my command service, and my command service calls event store append because it's a new payment, it doesn't read anything, and then it calls event store through gRPC. This, in the same service, in the payment service, there is this shovel thing, right? It consumes an event, it handles and produces one, which is a new one. It puts it in the payment integration, and it's now called Booking Payment Recorders, the one we saw in the integration stream. And bookings get it. Say, look, because they start to handle this event, they need to retrieve the booking with ID 123. Of course, they call Event Store again. And then they append a new event, that, uh, actually two. It's uh, payment recorded in the booking and booking fully paid. <laughs> These events go forward and get consumed by my projections. So you can see that it's booking projections, and this one is, so where is it? It's booking state projection, and this one is, and both of them are like that, and this one, booking states, and this one, booking states, and this one. Oh, wait a sec. <laughs> Reset route, yeah, fine. So here, in the phone consumer, we can, we can state, we can state, we can state. Oh, that was record payment, payment equation handler. 
there is somewhere here in this list of spans, there is a span that actually shows my bookings. But nevertheless, the point is that you see that the, the whole trace goes over the service boundaries. And it, like, even when my subscriptions are pretty tricky in terms of like pretty clever, so when they read from event store, like receive events from event store, one of the things with subscriptions that you read one event, you process it, and then you read the next event. So you, com you get a combined latency of reads and writes as your total latency of event handling in, in projections. If you parallelize this, you say, I read, 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 and write, write, write in another thread, it goes faster. So that's what it does. It actually separates the reads from writes in subscriptions. Um, there is another cool thing in, 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 in subscriptions and adventures. You can actually partition your subscription in memory using a given partition key. And I have a test that runs the same set of events, it's random events, 10,000 of them, and it projects them sequentially or partitioned with 10 consumers, 10, 10 handlers in parallel. Like, so you uh, increase the concurrency level to 10, and I got eight times speed improvement. And they were having a delay, like five milliseconds, simulating database call. So one of the things people say, my projections are slow and I get stale data because I receive like thousands of them per second. My linear thing cannot cope with that. And say, can you parallelize your calls to the database? He says, yeah, my MongoDB cluster in Atlas supports 50,000 connections. I can call it in parallel. I'll use this and that will have eight times a time faster projection. And it solves a lot of issues. Nevertheless, back, get back to observability. You can see that this operation goes over a lot of different places and you can see them all, right? And it was one more operation in here. Show, yeah, that I need to reset the route. Basically, when I was trying to, I think it's gone now. When I was trying to read the stream, you will see that there is an error. You can see this, the, the, where it actually occurred. I think I can do it still here. Book. Again. All right, so query. A few seconds ago, here. Yeah, this is an error span, right? And sometimes you observe your thing to go slow, but you don't know what it is and you have just instrumented your API, which is by default, right? That's an easy thing to do. You just drop in the thing, and you already have your API instrumented. But then without the other th parts of the application instrumented, you don't know where it becomes slow. And here you can see that appending an event to like sending it through the RPC to events to RDB is not that slow. Everything else is a bit slow. Maybe there is some DI thing that is lazy and instantiated, whatever. The point is that, or maybe this is how exceptions are working in .NET, I don't know. But it tells me that some stuff can be optimized. And one thing to watch in events or systems, like I told you about slow subscriptions and stuff like that, and it could lead for your system to be lagging behind. So like, your system has domain operations going on and producing, let's say, 100 events per second, and you have your uh, read models in SQL Server, and the SQL Server is slow because it's like someone decided to remove half of the indices and stuff like that, or whatever. Or now, the other way around, they decided to create thousands of indices and transactions become slow. And uh, what you need to see that basically it's okay to have some staleness there, so we can overcome staleness with the result that the ventures returns to the UI, for example. But at some point, you need to go to the list and see your data, right? So. What's the problem with that? If you don't monitor how far your tail of your, the, the tail of your subscription, how far it is from the tail of your stream, right? You don't know how stale your projections are, your read models. And then like how hard, how, how good your read models are representing the reality. So we provide a couple of ways to do it. In particular, um, it's localhost 5000. Um, Eventus collects lots of metrics which are abstraction or using abstraction from latest uh, package from uh, .NET 6, which is also available in .NET 5 and stuff like that. And 
applying OpenCLM to just saying add eventuous monitoring and uh, add eventuous traces when you configure OpenCLM tree will instrument the whole thing out of the box. And these metrics are like, just see this bit, um, where is it? Here. This bit here is the, uh, this is the same histogram, it just uh, has a cardinality by status code. This is 409 and this is 200. It's the same histogram. It splits things to buckets you can observe. This is default uh, part of the OpenTelemetry.net. You just drop a package and it works, right? This is HTTP. What do we have here? We have a event store um, histogram that does the same, but for internals of eventures. How fast you read events and how often and how fast and often you append events. And it gives you the sum of, op uh, of the, like, how long oper all the operations executed, the number of those operations, and so on and so forth. But this one, what is this? This is the application service, how fast and slow it processes commands. This is the subscription metrics, quite a lot of them, because they have cardinality by subscription ID and event type, so you can put different graphs on top of it. But these two are most important ones. This is the gap in count, and this is gap in seconds. And right now I have some small issue, but I promise I will fix it, because my system is not under stress, it's not receiving any events, so the gap is growing. I say, the last event I processed was 803 seconds ago, because I don't receive anything new. Uh, but here is the count. This count is strange, because EventsTorDB uh, has this weird thing with commit position on the all stream, but just ignore it for now. It's negative, so it's good. <laughs> but this is supposed to be like this. Zero, everything is processed. And if you can have one, two, ten, maybe even thousand, and you can have a time of 10 milliseconds or one minute, but it needs to be within the SLA that you establish how fast my read models need to update, how big the lag of subscription that I can tolerate within my system or certain parts of the system. So by measuring this and setting alerts to all the things, you can understand how your system behaves and when you need to intervene. And this part is missing badly in many, many systems I've seen. Because people run event source quite complex system in production don't know how stale the data, the data is and how the system actually behaves. Because the spans give you an idea how, where do your message go? Basically, you publish a message and it goes somewhere and you don't even know where. And someone comes to you and say, you know, I'm calling you from Hong Kong. I consume a message, my application crash. What's going on? So I'm not even aware that you're consuming it. With traces, if you use distributed traces, collect it to some decent APM provider, you will have everything in one place. And everyone supports it, like Datadog, New Relic, Elastic APM, Azure, whatever, up inside, uh, X-Ray in AWS, and Stackdriver in Google. So, where are, we dis where are we supposed to end? It's like six minutes left, or we're ready now. I want to get back to this thing, which is called the slide deck, and see what else I have. Future plans. Um, right now, this is like, there are bunch of people using it, but what I'm aware of and what I'm working with is currently uh, in ABAX we're building gigantic systems that's going to replace, not a gigantic, it's going to replace a gigantic system, part of the monolith, and take over the like quarter business events, not event, tree processing, and make it event source. Now it's all SQL based. Because we want to scale, and this allows us to scale more because we do have like, we do have different parts of the system, Okay, I don't want to go to details. There is ABAC stand over here. <laughs> Talk to the guys, they know about it. But the point is that it's, this system will be processing one and a half, no, about 10 million events per day in relatively soon. And we're already testing it on, um, on these volumes right now in staging environments, so it, it works really well. Um, but still, I'm preparing to release 0.6.0, and has a lot of stuff, including the, the, the observability, parallelized subscriptions, some decent level of concurrency handling, um, and a bunch of other things. And of course, most of the things are not documented. They are documented in the API, though, using XML comments. I'm going to document them properly this month. 
And the interesting thing I want to do, because developers sometimes suffer, like I need to go to my event store, which doesn't always have a UI like event store DB. I want to read the stream of a single aggregate, and I want to see what an aggregate state is without making a projection for it. I already started to make a tool that make it happen. It, it would be very much like the React Dev tools. And you can even have a time machine go back and forth. But only in, like, in memory, you don't persist anything, but you can actually see how it change, your state changes. And it's surprisingly easy to do. And there is a PR to do the Kafka producer, and we want to wrap it up and have a producer and subscription because that's something we use in ABAC. So one of the things we do with Adventure is like we use the tool, we bring it in. And I'm very, very excited about bringing things to serverless world, but there is a big obstacle there, like how do you create real-time subscription that needs to run continuously and call the serverless functions, or lambdas, and stuff like that, sequentially in order. That is an interesting challenge, and I want to do it, and I think I would be able to do it like either before the end of December or in January. And I'm looking like if you want to use something else, because we only support Event Store DB, you can implement an interface, I Event Store, and it will work. So you can use something like Martin with Postgres, Cosmos DB, I heard people do it, and stuff like that. Uh, if you need any help, I can kind of advise you what characteristics of Event Store needs to be supported. But remember, it needs subscriptions. These are the links. But it's easy to find. If you can pronounce the word, you can Google it, and you will find it. And uh, is there, uh, are there any questions? I can't see you, so if you, just shout out if you want to have any questions. No questions. I'm here for the rest of the conference, so um, just come over. If you want to uh, learn more about OpenTelemetry in .NET and new APIs, activity source, and stuff like that, I will be talking about this later today. Thank you very much.